Welcome to uh, African American African Studies, second in our brown bag uh, lecture series. I'm uh, Halifu Osamare, professor in the program, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Vajra Watson, today, and she's going to be speaking on a um, uh, a topic that's very close to my heart because it's from uh, the city that I worked in for over 17 years uh, before I became an academic. Uh, Oakland, California is, uh, gets a bad rep, <laughs> a bad rep a lot because, uh, you know, of all the things that are going on there, but there's always been a lot of political and cultural activism coming out of Oakland. I mean, after all, Oakland is the uh, home of the Black Panthers. Quiet has kept the original Black Lives Matter movement. And um, also a lot of cultural activism. I started a cultural center there in 1977, giving away my age. Um, and uh, it's uh, still, even though the, the uh, uh, official nonprofit is no longer in existence, the energy that it created is still going on today. Uh, at the Malonga Cascade Lord Center for the Arts, one of the major centers for African and black dance and art forms in the country. So um, Oakland uh, has a lot of things going on that is um, very progressive, um, has always led the way in, in, in um, uh, a lot of the progressive movements, including um, the uh, Black Studies Movement, out of which this whole program comes. So um, I am going to first introduce uh, Dr. Watson, and she will give her presentation. And we're going to leave about 15 minutes for a Q&A, where you can interact with her and ask her any questions that you might like. She is the Director of Research uh, Director of Research of Policy and Equity in UC Davis's Division of Student Affairs. She's also the founder of Sacramento Area Youth Speaks, or SES, an innovative critical literacy program for Sacramento area public school youth. Her research areas include the sociology of education, critical race theory, critical pedagogy, democratic education, and social justice youth development. She has a doctorate of education from Harvard University, and her major publication is Learning to Liberate, Community-Based Solutions to the Crisis in Urban Education. And I think she put a copy of her text somewhere on the table that's kind of being passed around. If you pass it around, you can kind of look at her major publication. But she also has uh, an in-press article that's about to come out in Berkeley Review of Education, which relates to this talk, because the, uh, the article is called Black Lives Matter, Oakland Unified uh, School District's Commitment to Address and Eliminate Institutional Racism. Her, her talk today is The Black Sunrise, S-O-N-R-I-S-E, Oakland Unified uh, School District's Commitment to Address and Eliminate Institutional Racism. If we could only be so blessed, huh? But we are blessed with Dr. Watson today. Thank you, thank you. Well, first and foremost, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Um, I'm so honored to be here and to see all of you and to have an opportunity to share a bit about the research that I've been doing in Oakland. Um, Dr. Halifu is really a legacy in the town, as we would say, um, for her work, you know, opening an art center, but really being a cultural keeper. And a lot of the people that you'll meet through this research are cultural keepers in this long, long legacy of resistance um, that we see happening all over universities um, across the country. We see kind of global resistance, um, and so much of what is happening is really led by the, the young um, and really wanting to elicit that. We don't have a lot of time. I'm going to um, go just kind of through some information and um, take you along to my research journey to give you guys some more information, and then we can have some dialogue at the end. How many undergrads are in here? Raise your hand if you're an undergrad. <clears throat> All right, graduate students. 
Faculty, staff, okay, okay. Well, thank you for being here. I know you guys are giving up um, some of your lunch time. So the first thing that, um, that I just want to preface my talk is saying um, a lot of critical theory, and I consider myself a critical theorist in many ways, is a reaction to kind of hegemonic white supremacy and structures of empire. Y'all with me? <laughs> Yet scholars far too often stay within that paradigm even as they are arguing against it. So the narrative becomes a narrative of studying the problem, deconstructing the problem, and talking about the problem. And in my research, I really try to uplift solutions of practice, find these warriors that are in the world trying, grappling, struggling to improve things, and seeing what they're doing. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about it in Oakland, the Black Sunrise, Oakland Unified School District's commitment to address and eliminate institutionalized racism. If you ready, say yep, yep. Yep, yep. Okay. So the schoolhouse in 2015, we got Springfield High, South Carolina, child abuse. We've all seen the video. We don't have sound working, but this shouldn't be anything new to you. We've all seen it, right? So our focal point um, this afternoon really is the school. We also, in the Says family, we just had a student pass away on Friday night that many of you, I'm sure, heard of at Grant High School, um, JJ. And when he and his friend were shot, they did not go to the police station. They did not drive to a hospital. They drove back to school. They drove to their schoolhouse to find someone that would help them. And so again, the school as an entity of, of the system, of our communities, has a really interesting role. And as someone that studies schools, I look at both, both of these images um, and the way that, that sets context for what's happening inside the classroom. Very simple question. And we've all been in school. We're still in school, right? So school is a socialization process. Democracy and capitalism, we have the rhetoric of, of democracy in this country, and we have the reality of an economic system based on hierarchy. One of the greatest places where these ideologies collide is through school. And the reason that school is such a fundamental socialization process is because there's always an implicit and explicit education going on to try to teach us not just information, but our place in the social order. So we get taught who is invincible and who is invisible. We get taught who is a have and who is a have not. And the goal is that by the end of your time in school, you will have internalized your status in the social order. Again, why are schools so critical? Well, Carter G. Woodson, who I would say is really one of the forerunners of critical race theory, wrote in 1933, to handicap a student by teaching him that his black face is a curse and that his struggle to change his condition is hopeless is the worst sort of lynching. It kills one's aspirations and dooms him to vagabondage and crime. This crusade is much more important than the anti-lynching movement because there would be no lynching if it did not start in the schoolroom. And the, 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 the piece of this that I really want to emphasize, because a lot of times we see something wrong and our gut reaction as people in the movement is to go protest and to, you know, look at the after effects. And he was really critiquing, he was critiquing the anti-lynching movement. He was critiquing folks going out there and, um, and, and begging systems to stop lynching people. Because he said, you know what? Two types of people were created in the classroom. The person that do the lynching and the person that allows it. 
And both those mentalities created in a schoolhouse. So he was, he was arguing this in 1933. How does this now relate to Oakland Unified School District? Well, in Oakland in 2009-10, 17% of the population was African American males. 42% were suspended annually. We're only going to take a moment on the negative stuff because, like I said, I'm a critical theorist that likes to challenge all that's wrong with the world. 517 students arrested on campus, 75% of them black. Only 28% score proficient in English. Only 30% score proficient in math. And if I can get someone to read this. School had me believing I was a bad kid who needed to be fixed. So there was an environment happening, an ecosystem, where young people were internalizing the low expectations and expecting little of themselves. Then you look at stats from 2014, 2015, just four, really just four years later, and a generation, right? Ninth to twelfth grade, four years later. Manhood development classes were started. And then you start seeing 450 students at 17 school sites. GPA increases from 2.112. And reading scores are increasing. So this is when I was brought in, was to look at from here to here, what happened. And I'm a qualitative researcher, so I was really intrigued by this question. And the manhood development classes through the Office of African American Male Achievement started in 2009, 2010. And the questions that I wanted to ask of this department and of this program is three So culture, conditions, capacities. What are the rituals? that are happening in these spaces that are allowing young people to not just survive but thrive? What are the conditions in terms of what the adults are doing? And then what are the skills and knowledge that these adults need to effectively reach and teach African American males? And before I go into some of the findings, um, so in 2010, what was the, and Halifu asked me this when I, when I first um, sat down. The, the superintendent and the community looked intergenerationally across time. They looked at a longitudinal study, and they realized for generations in Oakland, black families would send their children to school, and they would not achieve. Regardless of the school site, regardless of the learning theory, regardless of all these things, the system was continuously failing these students. So I came in and I did my interviews, my youth surveys, my secondary data, my participant observation for all the nerds in the house to see how I triangulated some of my data. And I use portraiture as my research methodology. Uh, it uses the rigor of scientific inquiry and methodological tools found in other forms of qualitative research, but is unique because of its defining attributes. Relies upon the entirety of your being to not simply listen to a story, but listen for a story. Utilizes narrative storytelling techniques to construct portraits complete with real characters symbolic metaphors, intricate context, and a compelling arc. Findings must engage and be accessible to broad and diverse audiences as an explicit act of intervention and community building. So the Office of African American Male Achievement <clears throat> were having these good results, and they were contacting academics and researchers to come in and do studies on their program. And when the evaluators were coming in and doing studies on their program, what they were getting in return did not reflect the work on the ground. And they felt that it was missing some of the soul of the work in the final kind of story that was being told. And so not only could the adults not kind of digest the information, but the families couldn't, the young people couldn't. And 
the executive director, Chris Chapman, his wife happened to be reading Learning to Liberate, and she had it like by the bed, and he picked up the thing, and he was like, man, I think I need to contact this lady and see if she could come and tell what we're doing and see the, the soul of the work. And so much of what portraiture is is to find that seed of the story. So here are some of the seeds of the story. And these are just a few pieces. So Richard Wright, back in the day, in Native Son, says, I always think of white folks. They kill you before you die. Who want to read this quote from one of the manhood development program moms? Anybody? Any moms in the building? Or anybody want to rep the moms? I see two, two male hands go up. But here it goes this. I'm convinced that schools expect black children to underachieve. They don't push them as hard as they do the other kids. I'm convinced the way I look at, at it is I sent three very brilliant young kids to school, and somewhere along the way, they got messed up. They got discouraged. So over and over again, parents that I talked to talked about that when their kids started kindergarten, they had light in their eyes and hope in their being. And slowly but surely, school was dimming that light. And they were still saying, baby, go to school every day. Get good grades every day. But it wasn't translating into improving their lives. Rather, schooling was a place that was kind of furthering their disenfranchisement. So the brothers that started the Office of African American Male Achievement wanted four things originally. They wanted to develop a class taught by African American males for African American youth in middle and high schools. And their first thing they did is they said, give us all your, your bad, underachieving black, black males at your school. That was the first semester. It was in three school sites. And they realized it had, they had recreated a dumping ground of black male achievement. So they pushed pause, and they said, we're not doing something right here. And so they decided, we're going to make heterogeneous classes of black males. They would take a third students who were far below basic, barely coming to school, kids that were kind of middle of the road, and kids that were high achieving, and they would create a brotherhood in these spaces create a safe space for African-American young men at school, recruit and retain African-American male mentors and educators, utilize a culturally relevant curriculum, provide opportunities to experience life out of school. So the program was so effective with that treatment group from those three schools that first year that they jumped to 17 schools. So now, four years later, a lot of the students that I interviewed, they have no idea of an education system that does not contain the Manhood Development Program. Uh, Brother Abdel Kwai, he was one of the um, architects of the program. Who wants to read his quote? Someone has to take responsibility for showing us the beauty of who we are by demonstrating a counter-narrative to the stereotypical images that surround us. And one more from a school counselor. Mm -hmm. I am grateful to have a brother foster as a catalyst for this work on our campus and appreciate how he facilitates and models black love for our young brothers to emulate. So irrespective of these four kind of cornerstones of the program, it's really getting into what is the soul of the work that's happening in these spaces. And so the school counselor says that it's not just love, but it was something in this black love, this black interaction of space that was irrespective of other students and of white people in particular that was allowing young people to find their voice and shine academically. Here's one of the teachers who wants to be Brother Jahi, teaching resistance, loud and proud. Great. This class builds self-esteem, relieves the feeling of personal responsibility for symptoms of an unjust and racial social system that most severely affects African-American males. 
The cloth allows for close connections with positive role models who teach, lead by example, and encourage the members of the class to dare to dream about their future. What do you guys hear in this, in this teaching pedagogy? What do you hear? That you, you, you can't blame yourself. Uh, you are the victim. You cannot mm -hmm. blame um, yourself for, for failure because mm. the system is the one who failed you. Mm. Especially when we think about that baby's comment right in the beginning, that they believed that they were broken and needed to be fixed, versus starting to believe you're brilliant needing to shine, and that transformation. So in all of these classes, here are the standards, respect for ourselves and each other, keep it 100, tell the truth, lift ups, no put downs, look out for each other, play hard but also work hard, represent your best self at all times, be on time, be responsible for your actions, build the brotherhood, trust yourself and others in the brotherhood. And here are the books for, for the nerds. Here, here's the canon in these classes. You guys should just take that in. I hope that most of you have read all these books as college students, especially if you think you're critical and you're conscious. This is, a, this is the conscious canon, at least according to Afrocentric uh, teachings. But the babies are reading James Baldwin. They are reading Sheikh Anta Diop. They are reading France Fanon and analyzing France, how France Fanon relates to gentrification in Oakland. Um, J.A. Rogers, Ida Van Sertema, um, Autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh, and so they're also reading books like The Pact, which is kind of much more about a, mo a modern day uh, brotherhood in terms of making it to and through school. Because it really tells how he um, how he became mm -hmm. he realized that he was really human mm -hmm. um, and and not uh, uh, destined to be a slave. So let's I want to read this um, together as a collective uh, when I start pushing play. Uh, but um, so I asked 200 students over 200 students at the beginning of the year to describe being a young black male in America. So before, these are kids that had never had the manhood development program. And um, to really start to document the ways that young people were making sense of themselves in relation to the world around them. So let's read these. Scared, hiding, survival. We'll get on rhythm. Underestimated, underappreciated, alone. Dangerous, humbling, targeted. Hard, need to be a hard worker, very stereotyped. Feared, not respected. Underestimated, statistic, ignorant. Horrible, bad, sad. Hard, poverty, poor. Hard, unfair, scary. Hard, stereotypical. Hard, discrimination, dangerous. Discriminated, unfair, treated differently. Mistreated, life, hard. Lonely, broke, oppression. So the, the positive words were piecemeal. So to randomly act you know, to randomly ask over 200 middle and high school students describe being a young black male in America and that positive attributes don't roll off the tongue speaks of a greater conspiracy. So in these classes, the focus when you go into these spaces are on relationship. What are some things that you guys need to have a good relationship? Trust, right? In any relationship, you gotta have trust. What else you gotta have in a good relationship? Communication. 
You've got to have communication. Those are the cornerstones. We've got love in the middle and some trusted communication on the side. You're probably going to be good. But unfortunately, in so many of our classrooms, that relationship component is non-existent. And the young people describe that. So from there, once you have a relationship, you can bring in a curriculum that's relevant because you already are gauging who those young people are. The problem is, is a lot of teachers, great, amazing teachers, you could run an effective classroom with these two things on top, with having strong relationships and relevance. And you could actually have an effective classroom. Because you know what? You wouldn't have classroom management problems because everybody's the homie and everybody's just kind of chilling and getting to know each other. And wow, people would say you're a great teacher. But the kids don't move intellectually. That's where the rigor comes in. That's where the reading Franz Fanon in ninth grade comes in. And dissecting Du Bois in ninth grade comes in. Or in seventh grade, reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. When Jahi teaches the autobiography of Malcolm X, he only has the seventh graders reading when Malcolm was in seventh grade. He took out all the pieces of Malcolm when he's in seventh grade, and that was the pieces that they read and dissected. So that's where rigor meets relevance, because they're in seventh grade. They're experiencing some of those same things. And then the piece about responsibility. The more you know, the more you owe. That there's a brotherhood, that the purpose of your knowledge is not for you alone. The, the analysis could end there. But we have to always be aware of the implicit pieces, the messages even outside and inside of school related to racism and white supremacy. This is kind of just thick, so I wanted to read it. This is from the second report that's coming out, so it's not in this one. The second report is on how a school district, not just a class, how an actual school district addresses and eliminates institutionalized racism. Since racism exists in the milieu of social interactions and systems, it is experienced at birth and and reify before children even formulate their first word. Without the language or historical context to deconstruct why certain people are perpetually disadvantaged, oppression gets operationalized, intuitively, and internalized. These patterns often become self-fulfilling prophecies of marginalization and privilege, the building blocks for westernized hierarchies. So I'm going to pull a student quote that backs that up. It's like this rage that is particular to black children because you see what your parents go through. You see what your cousins and everybody who is older than you goes through. And you don't know why good people are treated like shit. You don't know why your school looks like this when the other school down the street looks like that? Or why when you wear this same pair of clothes two times in the week, well, they get something new? You see everything happening and you understand it as being wrong, but you don't know why it's happening to you and only people who look like you. So you're just angry and you want to lash out at something. So when your teacher is like, read a book, sit down, shut up, it makes you really combative, like, nah. You don't listen to authority as well. Authority doesn't mean anything to you. So basically, I said, you're being asked to respect a system that does not respect you. Exactly. So all you do is have anger. So one of the things that this student said is that you can get us into college, you can even get us to wear a suit and tie, if you do not deal with the root causes of our anger, which is white supremacy, then we will never heal. And we'll carry facades. We'll wear masks. 
instead of making social change. So the context is always racism. The backdrop is always white supremacy until we find ways to challenge it. So let's see what happens when the kids end the class. Let's read this together. So this is after a semester now of reading these texts, of having a brotherhood, of going through the program. This is a middle school student. Identity, how do I see myself? On y'all, louder, prouder. This baby wrote all this. I am the bullet in the chamber. I am the chosen one. I am the American dream. So to go in terms of demonstrating these acts of transformation and the healing that occurs in being able to name the anger and contextualize the anger, which so few reports do. They look at black children as if they were the problem. So key findings from my research is that Oakland dared to name institutionalized racism and not the children as the problem. Consequently, all aspects of the manhood development program were on helping these students not just survive in a racist world, but also thrive with the tools to advocate for themselves and their communities. So years before Obama adopted the My Brother's Keeper initiative, this work was happening on the ground in Oakland. And the nation and school districts in particular have a model for African American student success. And that these students, given the right environment and input points and educators are brilliant, always have been, always will be. And that for this to be effective, the purpose of school has to be reconceptualized. So if school is either functioning as a socialization process towards capitalism or as a practice of liberation, each teacher and each school is in their day-to-day -day operations choosing the way that they're conditioning young people to dream about possibility or not. We're back. We're back to this little schoolhouse and all its potential. Anderson, in the Education of Blacks in the South, demonstrates the first public schools in this country were started by black people connecting literacy and liberation. And that when it got institutionalized, Schooling became get your good job, it's all about getting your money and economics and the Industrial Revolution and all these other components. But the heart and soul of learning is liberatory, is resistance. So I say that, man, the bomb, there's, there's, the bomb is in Oakland. Not the bomb, there's so many different words, there's so many alliterations for bomb, right? It's the bomb. Folks smoke the bomb, like all these different things for bomb. But bomb is also a healing ointment, a sacred space. So in, in rooting the work to like the bombs that we need, we can actually address some of this national trauma. For if the youth are not initiated into the village, they will burn it down to feel its warmth. If that ain't real talk, what is? Boom. There's some of my resources. Takara, you ready? All right, let's hear ya. Sack girl, black girl, you rock girl. And when you make it to the top, don't stop girl. I said sack girl, black girl, you rock girl. And when you make it to the top, don't stop girl. Kill a California, stand up. I rep the West Coast and the West rep tough. Cali girls do it better, so you know we turn up. And we talk 
a little different, but we ain't crazy. See, I'm from California where the grass is not so green. Not too fond of palm, we like those other types of trees. I'm from Meadowview, the 95823. Knockers in my ponytails and bakes on my feet. Sam Pinnell summers and that good old Mexican corn stuck in my teeth. Y'all know about that Mexican corn. Mm -hmm. With the mayonnaise and cayenne pepper and Parmesan cheese with RIP. RIP to Freeport Elementary. And to every school that was closed down before admitted out of the gates. To kids like me who were smart and kind of stayed in the way. RIP to my teachers who were scared of their students because of where they came from. And blame the sloppy teaching on the students' behavior. RIP to my big homies, my little homies, and the sex they claimed to the mothers that went crying and screaming when they seen white chalk and caution tape. But this is California, the California IA, where we hold the highest dropout and sex trafficking rates, like for real. A baby right now between the ages of 9 and 17 is somewhere busting a date. But in these schools, I mean these prisons, though these schools, I mean these prisons, though these schools, I mean these prisons. That abolish and reestablish slavery within the same amendment and rather spend $30,000 or more on your child as an inmate than as a student. California has 60 county jails and even more prisons, all filled with kids who couldn't make good grades. And prisons fill up quicker when you fail to properly educate. But this is California. The California IA, I guess, a couple miles down the road, those palm trees and five bedroom homes seem to have given the suburbs a different economy. I don't have books in classrooms, but my mayor figured out how to bring back a raggedy basketball team. Meanwhile, I can't eat, I mean, I could eat, but the only food around me is bad for me. We have more fast food restaurants and healthy food options, and they wonder why poorer kids are so obese. You could buy a burger for a dollar or less, but a bag of apples or oranges costs $3.69, so the difference doesn't seem like much. Three mouths to feed becomes many when your mother only has five bucks. So you submit your Epicurean delights to McDonald's, and you press your luck, I'm done. Living in the fallacy of the 90210, killer California. Stand up. I rep the West Coast and the West rep tough Cali girls do it better, so you know we turn up. And if you ain't feeling my city yet, then you ain't doing enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, baby. Yep. Takara Johnson coming out of Sacramento area, you speaks on her full ride to UC Davis. Black Aggies in the building, what's up? <laughs> All right, let's take some Q&A. What y'all think? Um, I just want to say, that is what's up. <laughs> 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 yep, 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 thank you so much. So here's our time to interact with uh, Dr. Watson. Questions, comments? Questions? Yes, sir. All right, so you talked about how hopeful, <coughs> bright African-American kindergartners enter school mm -hmm. and then slowly and slowly the school kind of diminishes their hope, mm -hmm. and something like that. Mm -hmm. How exactly, if you can answer that, how exactly does that happen? I think that one of the methods, and that's why I showed that video in the beginning, of the girl being uh, dragged, the 16-year-old in her algebra class. So the physical school violence that some young people are being taught to be caught. They're in a state of arrested development where their schools or the classes that they're in resemble more of a prison. And other young people are in a state of youth development. And, and how do you grow to thrive? And so I think that those dichotomies are really important to examine. And so low expectations, the violence of an irrelevant curriculum. So think about violence as structural violence, and then also think about the interpersonal violence that happens within space, I think are some of the, the inroads that start to um, dismantle. But the thing is, the school is part of a larger social system, right? And so it's not to say the school is the only culprit. It's that if education is not going to be our path to liberation, what is? So schooling becomes this important vehicle for transformative practice. Um, I'd like to piggyback. 
feedback on that. And there are um, graduate students in the School of Education here that are doing research on the uh, dis uh, the disparate kinds of um, discipline that's going on in the schools, um, looking at race as an indicator. And so um, it has been proven through a lot of data that um, it is the, the black children in most of the public schools that are getting disciplined and suspended uh, a lot more than uh, whites. And this causes that, that kind of victimization and the sense that um, for the same infractions, you are treated differently and are, in fact, um, uh, suspended from this so-called um, um, educational institution. And I think that that plays a large part in, in feeling like you do not belong. Yes. And then I have a question for all of you, too. I'll take some. Because I want to know, what do you guys also think that the Black Sunrise has to do with students that are not African American? What are the re research repercussions um, for these diverse school settings? So that's just a question to prose back to you. But you had a question? How do you see that <coughs> playing into the development of black masculinity? And in what ways does that interface with contexts that are inter multiple genders? Um, that's such a great question. And some of the some of the structures that they identify kind of across the spectrum, even though I think the, the stereotype of the class is that it's very kind of hyper masculine, but when you go into the spaces and you know sit with the instructors and talk about how they identify and the way that they're trying to complicate not only what it means to be black as one dimensional, but what it means to be a man as one dimensional. And that um, the instructors they told me that this generation in particular has such a broader conception of identity development than a lot of us, I feel like, as academics are looking in these narrow, narrow pieces. So it's not about, um, you know, this one way. It's about what is the spectrum and how do you freely express yourself, and that being the driving question. Other questions, comments, concerns, criticisms? Uh, originally, the original research was 2010, 2011. And then you're looking at, so I'm wondering, and then you had uh, 2014, 2015. And but you had mentioned in seventh grade that they start. Uh -huh. So there has there been a cohort of students that has gone all the way through the program? They start at seventh grade, and they, so they proceed to graduation. So that's already how many, and how many? Or how many groups of students? That's great. Like how many cohorts? Yeah. So last year was the first graduating class. So from that 2010-2011 cohort of those three classes, the first group graduated and um, you know graduated high school, went to college. I don't. I could throw you a stat, but it's not going to be accurate because I don't have it in these notes. But they are now. So they're now in what tenth grade. So they haven't graduated high school yet. So then, yeah. I mean, because it seems like that data is going to be really, um, really, really positive at that point because you actually have Year, half, of that's their, right. half of their academic career and taking 12 years actually in that space to build those positive relationships and then address all that. So from the, they pair with the East Bay College Fund. So for that first class that went on to college, almost all of them got a full ride. And part of it's because there's so much money right now around like black male achievement and kind of all these things, which the timing was really beautiful for the Office of African American Male Achievement because now as those students are graduating, they're getting these full rides to school. Um, in terms of tracking students that have been in the program for multiple years, so I looked at four years of data, so students that were in the program, you know, for those four years. Um, in order to really start kind of digging through how that changed their practices in other classes. One of the things that I think your, your point brings me up that I, didn't, that I didn't talk about because of the time limitation, but so now I went from thinking like, oh, I can't do good in school to realizing like my ancestors built schools are the foundation of schools. Now I'm coming into class like I'm going to sit in front, I'm going to ask, and then these white teachers were like, 
what is going on? Like, what was the shift, right? And so there's a lot of professional development that's had to happen because it's no longer the same school. It's no longer the same space. And when, um, when Brother Christopher Chapman did his first meeting with principals when they launched the Office of African American Male Achievement, he said, close your eyes and picture a successful African American male on your campus. And no one could do it. So the whole idea of being like successful and black and male wasn't even like occurring as a narrative. And so flipping that narrative where young people were saying like, you know, we did this, we did that, and you know, really a little cocky, you know, like, you know, I invented algebra, you know, type thing. So now I'm gonna get an A in algebra. Um, but it was important for the for that for that shift to happen. Um, the other component in that I asked you guys in terms of how it relates to larger issues of integration, there is a move that the MDP curriculum in 11th and 12th grade will be open as an AP class because it's A through G, but the AP classes will be open to all students that they it'll be a space for it to be fully integrated. And so when I was asking students about this and teachers and questioning how that might affect the dynamic of the learning environment, the thing that was so interesting to me that I hadn't thought of is that they kept telling me like, man, the whole world needs to know we're great. Because us just knowing we're great is not enough. We need everyone on earth to realize like the University of Timbuktu or like the Dagon people or yeah, the, the real text of Frederick Douglass, not some February shallow, you know, piecemeal, you know, narrative of blackness. And so the students are really advocating for this larger uh, integration, which I think is interesting in the way that they've taken the lessons and then want to give that information to their peers. So yes, other questions, yes. So just a comment on that. I think that's really interesting because um, in Chicago there's a charter school district that targets kind of underachieving mm -hmm. black males. And one of the criticisms that one of my students was telling me um, whose brother had gone to the program was, exiting the high school, you know, everybody was graduating, but then there was like the shock because you're out in, you know, going to college and you're in this kind of integrated setting and you don't have the same tools mm -hmm. that you had in high school. And so I think that's really interesting that the students themselves are advocating for this integration because it's like you get to see yourself, you know, in a space where you're making decisions, where you're having a voice and everyone else gets to see you and not mm -hmm. just kind of a very um, contained safe mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. So I think that could be really positive. That's why it's very important for us to really continue in at the university level these ethnic studies programs that we have. Mm -hmm. yeah. All of the ethnic studies programs that exist right here in Hart Hall must be must be flourishing and, and they must put even more resources <coughs> into us that will help attract and um, bring students uh, of color into these institutions that then um, allow them to see themselves and continue that learning process. Yes, sir. What was the um, impact on the school, on the mm -hmm. entire school? So, you know, students were having, um, you know, this amazing curriculum with these amazing uh, instructors and, you know, first period and then second period they go in a math classroom and it's, you know, it's, uh, again, the arrested development part. Yeah. And then third period, they go arrested development. You know what I mean? And they continue. Like, was there, did the, did the school culture change mm -hmm. because of, the, of this program? And were other teachers, like, saying, like, what are y'all doing? We need to learn that, too. Yeah. Um, you know, just I want to mm -hmm. know, like, how did that fix, you know? Yeah. So that's a really good question. And it really came down to who that instructor was on the campus. So there were some instructors who... They really felt like their classroom was their space. They went in, they did their MDP classes, they're in their classroom, they got their brotherhood, and then they leave school. And, and there was frictions that developed because of that, because they were kind of like a renegade. They're like, I'm not part of the school, you know, all that. The instructors that started shadowing their students and almost took more of a case management approach, so they would go, so the kids would say, ma'am, my math teacher's hating on me. 
okay, well, here's how you deal with it. Still problem. Then they get a disciplinary infraction. That MDP teacher's there the next day, almost like, you know, just a parent would be sitting next to them trying to figure out what's going on. With those teachers, the impact was the greatest on the entire school culture. And they talked about that some of their students have been targeted so long and really just like, oh, you know, Johnny's coming in and Johnny is disruptive and all these things. Even though Johnny had started to change his behavior, the teacher hadn't caught up to that change of behavior. And so the instructors were um, told in their own kind of professional development internally that when they sit down with a teacher, the first question is, what are the three things that this student does well? And that they needed to ask that of every teacher when they were having these meetings with the teachers. Because they were trying to flip the narrative so that teachers, even if there was a problem, were, were focusing on what was happening that was exceptional and working and building off that positive progress. Um, and in those spaces where you had an alignment between the teachers feeling like they had this amazing ally on campus that was going to help them nurture the development of young people and the principal, it, it shifted the ecosystem of those schools, which is why it expanded so much because there were principals and teachers saying, we can no longer do this work alone. You know, we just can't do it alone. We need to have more partners inside the actual, like, curriculum development and then expanding it. And, and MDP, I mean, they do, they do professional development now for teachers across the board. Um, their three components is engage, encourage, empower, and that those three principles should be infused irrespective of your content. Because we're not teaching content, we're teaching human beings. So that human practice should always be at the forefront. Yes? Um, I just was wondering if there was some sort of integration that was planning to be happening um, as far as with the other students, just because until the counter narrative is congruent with the master narrative, you know, I, I'm very critical of what's going to change on the, on the wider scale. So, I mean, is there something happening with where these, where these white students or even Hispanic, Latino students are being incorporated in these? Because they need to know too, you know, they need to, they need to see this. So what you're saying, that's exactly what the youth are saying. That's what the, when the kid, that's exactly what they're saying. And so they're, that's the move right now. The move is to fully integrate the 11th and 12th. So the basically, and they say based on, so Wade Nobles talks about that black children need to have, be inculcated in a protective like zone to go through school. And so the students are like, yeah, kind of to your point, we've been protected. We ready, man. Like, let's. We want everybody in our classes now, and so um, and so that that is happening. And I would say probably within two years, those kind of tracks will have will have that diversity. And then Oakland has also now started other offices, you know, so that there is an office on like Latina Latino achievement, and that they're using MDP is this kind of beacon of where other other folks and departments could go. Same thing for African American girls. There's now an office that, that just started this year. Um, and it's only because of the data that happened with MDP that now the system is starting to invest in these other, these other avenues. Yes? Are there other districts or states or at the state level, are there people paying attention to this and seeing this as a model and trying to do something with it? That's a good question. So. Yeah, so like when Obama announced My Brother's Keeper, he flew a whole like cabinet to Oakland to study what was happening in Oakland before, like right before he launched My Brother's Keeper. And then he had some of these students at the White House. Um, the, Milwaukee, there's all these districts now that are being able to say, we've been trying to name institutionalized racism for a while. And some of the, like even the just different superintendents this is now allowing them not to reinvent the wheel. Um, so it's catching on. The problem or the fear is that this really happened organically from the community. And just having it become this top-down approach is always like, how is it going to be implemented? Sometimes in those meetings with that, like with superintendents nationally who want to adopt the program, um, 
you know, you kind of start with like, well, who do you think these children are and why do they need this? Oh, because black children just, nobody can deal with them. And I mean, it's just this negative narrative. And so I worry a little bit about the way some of those leaders are then translating it into practice. But it is happening. But it seems to me that you can't, the, you could if you were, if you were a superintendent and you had some power and you understood how this program worked, you have to step out mm -hmm. and you have to find these community folks mm -hmm. who are willing to come in and do the work because that's who did the work. That's it's right. It's not educators, not people who have a credential. It's people from the community who mm -hmm. came in. And that's a hard thing for, I would think, a superintendent or certainly at the federal level or the state level to step out and say, right, you need to come in and do this. Yeah, I think that's the crucial component that uh, if, if these, this kind of uh, program becomes a model nationally, there has to be a component that um, that the community itself is involved with, that uh, that that piece has always got to be a part of this, or else it's going to be a top-down approach, mm -hmm. and then that means that you know, um, as as usual, bu bureaucracy is going to kind of rule the day mm -hmm. instead of the, the the impetus coming from the people themselves who live this victimization on a daily basis. So. Um, to me, that piece mm -hmm. has to be woven into mm -hmm. the model if it's going to really mm -hmm. take off and be effective mm -hmm. nationally. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. Yes. No, last question. Yeah. So first of all, that was a wonderful pre presentation. I really enjoyed sitting in on that. And um, as a product of OUSD, I actually observed some of the successes of the and the development classes. And I was just kind of curious as to, like, what about the black women in the mm -hmm. OUSD art and school around? Country. Definitely. So I don't know if I answered somebody else's question. So they just opened an office of African American female achievement this year. Um, so is that what you were asking about, or something, or something yeah. else? Yeah. So they did open that this year. But you know, in the beginning, their um, the parent organizer who really helped you know get this off the ground. She did not want it to be called the Manhood Development Program. She wanted it to be called the Family Development Program. And she thought that it was um, a missed opportunity to isolate it to just black males. And there was a lot of friction in the beginning um, about that. And, and so that's something, you know, no organization, no program is perfect. And good research really tries to tease out all those components. So it's just also something to consider when we're thinking about this, like what this program would have looked like if it was really centered around like family success versus isolating singular students. Well, I think we should all thank Dr. Watson for...